question so you have a sense of the amazing man you're about to hear from. You know, Barrett has a long history in the field of sustainability and has, you know, done a number of projects and initiatives around the world. Um, he's also spent a lot of time working with businesses and organizations as a consultant, um, both in a sustainability context as well as outside of a sustainability context. He does coaching, so one-on-one -on -one work with executives and thought leaders and sustainability practitioners. Most recently, he was based in Amsterdam for a number of years with his family and was working with the Dutch government on large-scale sector change in the context of sustainability and working on the millennial goals and you know helping like the tea industry be more sustainable. So working with countries and multinational corporations in the context of a sector like tea to help coordinate and align what they were doing in light of the millennial goals and just moving the whole sector at a global level towards sustainability. So he's worked at you know depth with one-on-one -on -one. And he's worked at the global scale, you know, in a, in a ma pretty major way. So it's one of the really unique things that Barrett has is he's, he's very capable at each of those scales and is able, similar to how I was talking about the link between theory and practice and embodiment, you know, he has that, but he also has this amazing sense of sustainability and what it takes at the, you know, the micro level in terms of individuals and practitioners as well as, at, you know, a planetary level. He recently finished his doctorate and he did groundbreaking research on the, you know, the highest stages of adult development and, and what that looks like in terms of people's emotional capacities, interpersonal capacities, cognitive capacities in the context of sustainability and, and how sustainability leaders who demonstrate in a variety of ways the, the highest capacities of human development in those areas how do they drive change in a sustainability context? And so he did interviews and analysis of like, what are the key characteristics of individuals who are doing sustainability work from the most complex and embodied place? And so he's gonna be speaking about that. And this research was groundbreaking because it really built on some already groundbreaking work done by a woman out of Harvard around human adult development. And so Barrett's research has been some of the most profound research that's really deepened and extended her original research, and he did it into the context of sustainability. So that just gives you a few tastes of, of Barrett and his background, and here he is. Great. Sean and I both have five-year-old daughters as well. We have a three-year-old daughter, and so we're also in the middle of daddy land all of this as well. So as I look out across the group of you, I think of my daughter, you know, and I think about 13, 14, 15 years from now, she's going to be hopefully privileged enough to be taking a program like this and being exposed to not only real depth work of, of mind and heart, um, but really just out there in the world seeing how it happens on the ground. So that's, that's awesome. Really honor the work that you're doing, Ken, and the work that you're doing is important as well. And uh, so, today, what I want to do is share with you some insights from the research that I just did for the single reason that the research that I just did, I did for people exactly like you. So, basically, people that are sophisticated in the way that they see the world and are committed to changing it for the better and creating what I call a, an unprecedented flourishing of humanity and nature. So my intention is that uh, some of this will, will resonate with you and serve your own developmental process. I sent to Cam a whole academic article that has all the academic blah, 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 that kind of lays out all the details behind this, and we're just gonna get into just the practical aspects of it today and give you an embodied sense of it and, and, and play with some of the ideas. And I also recognize that I am the only thing that stands between you and lunch. So, um, <laughs> so we'll do our best to accommodate and try, try and land this around noon, um, between 12 and 12.15, okay? And then we'll shift over. 
So we'll first talk a little bit about our, our global context and then about leadership for sustainability specifically. And as Sean mentioned, basically my, my deep interest is what happens at the intersection of very complex consciousness and sustainability. Like what happens when people actually show up on the planet that are grounded in a depth of awareness and a depth of mind and a depth of heart that is very, very rare in its maturity? And what do they do when they're trying to design and engage in complex sustainability initiatives? So that's what my research has been about. And so I've gone into this mystery and come back with a few jewels that I think are worthwhile. And um, the research tends to actually is, is becoming pretty popular uh, across the planet. Um, it's serving in a lot of cases, and so I hope that it'll serve you. So uh, my PowerPoint is a little tweaked. What that says is that things are getting worse. And you've seen the data. You've been embedded in it as much as anybody. And so the reality is that, yes, every major ecosystem on, on the planet is in decline. And CO2 is at 393 ppm. And we're likely to peak over 500, potentially. Um, three degrees, we'll be lucky if we pull off not having that amount of global warming. And there's a significant chance that we'll be on the downward slope to runway global warming to four or five degrees. Uh, I just came back from Sweden where I saw a presentation by Peter Rockstrom from the <coughs> Stockholm Resilience Center. And um, he was just very, very, very clear about the, the scientific findings that are pointing toward this slippery slope that we're on and the deep work that needs to be done now. You guys are, are aware of this. So on, on, on one level, yes, things are getting worse. We need to also acknowledge that things are also getting better. <coughs> and that things are getting better for me means that we've actually made huge progress from a human development standpoint. And poverty, we've more people have risen out of poverty in, in Asia and South America and some parts of Africa than in, in the history of, of humanity. Uh, there's more equality in, in parliament and <coughs> schools from a male-female gender balance. And we're, we've made major strides um, at, at an economic and social level. <coughs> things also simply are what they are. We can judge them as getting worse, we can judge them as getting better, but there's also a third perspective that we can hold, which is this paradox that they simply are what they are. They're just arising, and then we bring a construct to them, we bring a judgment to them. A wise man that I once studied with said that the only difference between a flower and a weed is a judgment. And the only difference between things are getting better and things are getting worse is also a judgment. And so can we rest in this space, this paradoxical way of holding reality that they simply are what they are, and they're also getting better and they're also getting worse, right? So that's, that's our challenge. So here's some actual data. Um, this comes from the State of the Future report put out by the um, State of the Future folks at, at the Millennium Project. And basically, where things are green, we're actually winning. So we're winning in school enrollment, malnutrition, lack of water, number of physicians, major armed contracts, con or con conflicts. And where things are red are where we're losing, right? So CO2 emissions, refugees, voting percentages, corruption. And where things are, are yellow are where the trends, we're not able to actually identify whether they're going up or going down, right? So they're, we're in this liminal space around them. And so, Things are getting better, things are getting worse, and things simply are what they are. I am absolutely blown away by the power of humanity to impact the world. In the past 100 years, we have done an amazing, amazing thing. We've essentially managed to influence every single major Sphere on the planet, meaning the, litho the lithosphere, all the rocks and minerals and stuff like that. We've completely destabilized both the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles in, in the lithosphere. In the hydrosphere, we've got all sorts of freshwater issues that are arising. In the atmosphere, of course, the ozone issue, which hasn't gone away, by the way, and carbon. Um, in the biosphere, of course, species extinction at a mass scale impressive impact we've had. 
in civilization, of course, we're struggling with corruption and terrorism and, and HIV AIDS. So the, the beauty of this is what humanity has managed to do with 100 years of unconscious engagement. And why that's inspiring and beautiful to me is because it invites the question of what could we actually do with 100 years of increasingly conscious engagement on the planet. There is only an upswing on the level of consciousness that's coming into power and our understanding of the systemic impacts that we're having. We're just more aware of that and we're beginning to respond. And so what could we do with another 100 years of significant human global impact and even beyond that? So that's powerful to me because I know that we've, we can impact it all. And so while we're at this tipping point toward impacting it from an increasingly conscious space, it gives me deep hope that we're actually going to create an unprecedented flourishing of humanity and nature. Maybe not in our lifetimes, but this is a multi-generational initiative. <coughs> so, in my opinion, the world needs our big self. Let's talk a little bit about what I mean by big self. Tell me what you care about, and I'll tell you how big you are. There is a fundamental <coughs> understanding that's emerging in developmental psychology, in systems thinking, that the deeper our care, the deeper our fear of care and compassion for ourselves and those around us and the world, the bigger we are. I'm going to walk you through this in a very experiential way to give you an embodied sense of this. But what I'm talking about basically is this shift in what we care about from me to us. There's an us with your family. There's an us with, with maybe your relationship to your country or to your community. And we have access to this care for us very readily. There's also a care for all of us that emerges as well. So as we develop, we're able to drop into a deeper understanding and care for all of humanity, where it fundamentally matters to us that the number of billions of people on the planet that are living on less than two dollars a day, where that actually matters, where deforestation in India, or in Indonesia rather, actually, we feel it and we care. And there's an expansion beyond this into a care for all of it. All of it is pretty big. There's hundreds of billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. There's hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe. And there's very significant theoretical evidence supporting that there's hundreds of billions of universes. Mm -hmm. All of it is pretty big. However, there's a part of us accessible right here, right now, that we're going to drop into that actually cares for all of it. There's decades of developmental psychology research that basically is pointing out that there's all sorts of advanced capacities that come online as we make these shifts in development from caring just about ourselves to us, to all of us, to all of it. And I'm talking about significant leadership capacities that actually in, are measurably identified as making you a more effective leader. There's all sorts of research on this. And these are capacities that are cognitive, so the ability to connect the dots faster, see patterns, and make connections that no one else is making. These are capacities that are interpersonal, so the ability to tune into the emotional feeling of someone that you're in dialogue with, a stakeholder that's at the table, and they're starting to contract around a particular comment that you've made. And the ability to really sense <coughs> into that and feel that in your own experience, right? There's this 
sort of powerful interpersonal capacities that allow you to sense what's happening and also communicate in a way that deeply resonates with them. And there's also all sorts of powerful intrapersonal capacities that arise from self-awareness and this recognition of a, a deep understanding of what's actually happening inside of you in the moment. The thoughts that are arising, the feelings that are arising, the shadow stuff that's coming up that's about to <coughs> undercut your initiative in the moment. The frustration that you, you, you may have about something. And just this in the moment instantaneous recognition of it and not allowing it to take over your, your life in that moment and dominate the dialogue. Right? So there's these powerful capacities that come on board, including what is called unitive awareness, which is beyond just a system's understanding of the world around you, but literally recognizing and resting in a place that holds all of what's arising around us as one unified whole. Meaning that, please come in. Meaning that what's actually arising here is many faces of the same being in unity. With different lenses on, but fundamentally shining here, looking in at each other, trying to figure out how to get along. Right? There are thousands and tens of thousands of people that rest in this unity awareness on a daily basis. And I went and studied some of them who are also deeply engaged in sustainability work to see what they came up with and how they did it. And so what I want to do is walk you through a process essentially of actually feeling these different stages of development because they're accessible to all of us right here, right now as a state experience. What we're going to do is we're, we're, we're going to walk from the me to the us to the all of us to the all of it. And I'm going to call those egocentric ethnocentric, so caring about your ethnic group or your social group, world-centric, caring about the world, and cosmocentric. So what I want you to do is put your notebooks away um, and bring your presence here. Let go of Sean's talk. Let go of your girlfriend or boyfriend and what they're thinking, your parents or anything that's out there. Except the truth. And what I'm going to ask you to do is, is speak to the voice of each of these different aspects of ourselves. And what I want you to do is just popcorn answers back out to me. Okay, so I'm just going to ask a question, and just as you're feeling hot and about to pop, like a piece of popcorn, just speak it in, into the group. Okay? So I want you to just anchor in your egocentric self. I'd like to speak to the voice of your egocentric self. So this is easy. Who, who am I speaking to? Mm. Mm. The egocentric self. I'm not speaking to camera, and I want to speak to the egocentric self. Mm. Okay. So who, who, who am I speaking to? The egocentric self. Okay. The, the egocentric self. Okay. As the egocentric self, what I notice is... My emotion. My emotions? My foot's a little bit uncomfortable. Your foot's a little uncomfortable? Yeah. yeah. Desires. Back. Desires? What sort of desires? Food. Food. Sex. Sex. Comfort. Comfort. Great. We got that at 1215. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it. Food, sex, and comfort. I don't like thinking about just myself. Oh, you don't like just thinking about yourself. You're, you're, you're noticing that just thinking about yourself. Great. So just resting there. What I notice is? Body. My body. You're sticky. My heartbeat. My heartbeat. Feet are cold. My feet are cold. My back hurts. My back hurts. My nose is running. My nose is running. Insecurities. <laughs> the insecurities Anxieties. I have. Yeah, the, the needs you have. Pardon me? The needs you have, you say? Well, no, the, the fears and the anxieties, yeah. the uncertainties. Yeah. Great. The so, issues I can deal with, the issues I can't deal with. Yeah, let's talk about some of those. So as the e egocentric self, I enjoy sleeping. Sleeping. Water. Eating. Water. Eating. 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 Walking. Walking. Ice cream. Ice cream. Ice cream. Massages. And Sunshine. Sunshine. Movies. 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 Hacky sack. <laughs> sleeping. sleeping. I know you're all thinking, but I'll say sex. <laughs> Fresh air. Fresh air. Having smoke. 
Having smoke. Puppies. Puppies. Rainbows. When I Rainbows. get my way. When you get your <laughs> way. <laughs> Mac and cheese. Mac and cheese. <laughs> Thank you. As egocentric self, I'm challenged by myself. Myself. Fear. 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 Finances. 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 Anxiety. Anxiety. False expectations appearing real. False expectations <laughs> appearing real. I'm thinking your higher window. What I don't see. You're challenged what by I... what you see. Yeah, the, the, the unknown unknowables. Family. Family. <laughs> Let's shift a little bit. As, as the ethnocentric self. So I want you to anchor you in, in the us. So specifically, the people I care about are friends, friends sister. family, sister, cat, cat, yeah. cat. <laughs> cat <Best people>. friends, <laughs> the neighbors, field school. the field school, strangers as well, uh, my tribe, the villagers, the villagers, the village people, people who live, YMCA, YMCA, going <laughs> <laughs> <From> downhill. <laughs> Who do you care about? Um, my boyfriend. Your boyfriend, yeah. My son. You? The son. My um, son. Your son. <laughs> as the, as the <coughs> ethnocentric self, as a nationality or group, so it could be your UVic group here, could be you, you as an <coughs> American or, or a Canadian, Pick a group, pick, pick a nation. I am proud of. Sorry. Cascadia. Culture. My culture. Cascadia. So, so what are you proud about, about being from the Cascadian region? That we're all connected in a sense, and it doesn't matter what like, nationality. Well, I guess Cascadia is in the region. No. Mm -hmm. A region. Is. <laughs> we're questioning that. It's true. It's true. But, but, but you have a connection to it. Yeah. There's, there's, pride that you have around it as well. What else are you proud of? Proud of everyone here as a group. Uh -huh. Being a West Coastian. Being mm -hmm. a West Coastian, sure. Language. You're proud of your language. Open-minded. The open-mindedness of your group. Sense of humor. Sense of humor. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Good coffee and beer. Uh-huh. Yeah, so the cohesiveness plus the ability to express your full individuality. You're proud of that. So the support. And the support as well. Well, support for being an individual. So the, it's like yeah. this, and the support of having the space. Yeah. Within a group. Yeah. And you should be proud of that. It's a powerful, liberating structure for you as a human being to be in a space where you can fully show up as who you are. The inclusiveness of everyone here. The flexibility of everyone. As a choose your nationality or group, I am concerned that we don't give the space for individuality. Don't give the space for individuality. So we get a paradox there. Stubborn. That we're stubborn. We lose track of what's important. Caught up in life. Who's time to do this? Uh huh. We're high on ourselves. That we're high on ourselves. That we lose track of our privilege. No, we're not. That we lose track of our privilege. That we're apathetic. We're short sighted. Right? Slacktivism. Slacktivism? Is that a word? Slacktivism, yeah. That's, that's the, oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark, Mark, I, I Mark, click Mark. on Facebook for petitions all the time. Right? That's slacktivism. Um, I'm concerned that we what? Being Not living in the moment. Not living in the moment, thank you. Being judgmental. Being judgmental. That we're living just in the moment. That we're living just in the moment, thank you. That we're subject to group thing. That we're subject to group thing. Mm -hmm. Influenced easily. Easily influenced. Speak louder. That we're controlling and overbearing. That we're controlling and overbearing. Yep. Not, not influenced by issues important to mankind. Sure. And we're, I mean, to a certain extent, we, we can live in these these comfortable environments and really not be influenced and not, not have it deeply touch us. We're making the wrong we're decisions. decisions. We're, 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 we're making the wrong decisions. We're doing the wrong things. Uh -huh. I was just saying that, you know, in constant competition with the ego. Yeah. yeah. Um, who's going to win at that moment in time?
Yeah. Very easily distracted. Indeed. <laughs> okay, so let's shift a little bit here. Oh, I want to speak to the world-centric self. So just kind of move in your chairs a little bit. And shift into your, your world-centric self, which is right here, right now. We're just going to access it. Who am I speaking to? The world-centric world self. So as the world-centric self, I'm aware that there's lots of problems. That there's lots of problems. That we're due. That we're due. Lots of that it's getting hot. Lots of solutions. That there are lots of solutions. There's too many of us. There's too many of us. Simultaneously, that pops up. There's incredible privilege. There's disequity, incredible privilege. Consume too much. That we consume too much. That there's so many perspectives, all of which have a piece of the truth. Amazingly adaptive. That we're also incredibly resilient and adaptive. Yeah. There's a lot of capacity to be utilized. Yeah, to a huge extent, we are mm -hmm. underutilizing our capacity. That we will never fully, completely understand nature. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. So I'm challenged by, as the world centric self, I'm challenged by the inequalities we face. Lack of power. The lack of power sometimes we face. Presence too much privilege. Presence of power, too much privilege. Yeah, Seemingly being hardwired to be self centered. Uh huh. So challenged by basic biological stuff that focuses on fuck it or kill it. <laughs> I'm challenged by the complexity of the systems we deal with. Uh -huh. yeah. Challenged by the notion that I don't know many of us in the world. Sure, so many of us here. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the differences and yet the similarities that we share. Uh -huh. The stupidity of the other guy, never mind. Uh -huh. Fair <laughs> enough. I'm challenged by the disconnection. Mm. What was the first part of what you said? Yeah. Just challenged by... Challenged by the disconnections. Yeah, the internet connects us and... Yeah, it's challenged by the connect or the way that we are now connecting. Yeah. Which disconnects us. And it disconnects us, indeed. We worry that we lack the evidence to see that working together we can save ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. fair enough. By how, by how entrenched the problems are. I'm challenged by how entrenched the problems are. By our artificial constructs and our lines that we draw on the map that yeah. don't make sense. Of. Yeah, indeed, indeed, the very constructs that we're creating that are defining how we go about doing what we're doing. <laughs> As the world-centric self, I hope that that we unite. People change. That people change. That someone will fix it. That someone will fix it. <laughs> I'm wrong. <laughs> I hope I'm wrong. You hope that you're wrong about being due. Yes. I hope I make a difference. I hope that I make a difference. Can contribute to a balance in power. I hope that we can contribute to a balance in power. Thank you. I hope that hope isn't a waste of time. I hope that hope isn't a waste of time. I hope that a few more of us can spend a little bit more time in just big problems. That we can do? That we can do it. Continue. That we continue. I hope it's not too late. I hope it's not too late. You hope what? I hope lots of species don't die. Uh-huh. I hope that we can find a balance and a unity in both with natural spaces and each other. Beautiful. You got something coming. I can see it. Um, I, <laughs> I just uh, I hope that we can treat everybody as a human being. Yeah, that we have this real treatment and honoring of all humanity. Okay. Go. Well, I hope that we give the other millions of species a fair chance. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Thank you, Paul. I hope it's not too late to avoid great suffering. I hope it's not too late to avoid great suffering. I hope that everything I learn I can pass on to someone else. Thank you. I want to shift right now. So, shift in your seats. And this time, I want to speak to the cosmocentric self. This is the part of you that's accessible right here, right now, that cares for all of it. Who am I speaking to? The cosmocentric self. How big are you? 
Yeah. yeah. <coughs> growing. Immeasurable. Infinite. Uh -huh. Growing immeasurable. Yeah. Yeah. And small. Yeah. And small. How small? All the way down and all the way up, huh? Yeah. It's the concept of infinity. You don't know which end of the spectrum you want. How big are you? As big as you want to be. Beyond scale. Big as, big as you want to be. As big as God. Beyond scale. As big as the universe or multiple universes? When were you born? Every day. <laughs> Every day. It was real loud at my birthday. I don't know. <laughs> real loud. <laughs> a long, long time ago. A long time ago. Short time ago. A short time ago. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Constantly. Constantly being born. Right now. Right now. And now. And now. And now. And now. And now. And now. I saw you. <laughs> oh, you got born now. again. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's where you are, too. When were you born? Before time. Before time. <laughs> what do you include? Everything, every person. Every other species we will build with. Things every we haven't species. imagined. The things we haven't imagined, you include already. I include a very small portion of the things we have to include all the things we don't include. We include everything that we don't include as well. All pain, all possibility. Nothing. Nothing. Just you. You also include nothing. Uh, what do I know about that which I have absolutely no idea? I don't know. I don't know. You include that. What does sustainability mean from the cosmocentric side? Nothing. Simultaneous, simultaneous peril and hope. Simply the ability to continue to sustain everything that we include. Are you going away, cosmocentric self? Any chance you're going to get obliterated off the planet? Yeah. yeah. Possible. Depends. <laughs> no, but this right here, this awareness right here, right now. Yeah. Is this awareness going away? No. The question is, do you, are you saying every piece that makes up everything, or is the loss of one piece inconsequential to everything? Maybe something else crops up in place. Tell me, what happens if we lose one piece? Maybe something else better crops up to replace it. Maybe well, it right sets off a trigger and everything falls apart. Mm -hmm. And what do you include again? Everything. Okay. I think it's from a place of compassion where even the littlest being matters immensely. Now, who do you care about? Everything, every every little being. So, the research that I did was on folks who rest in the cosmocentric space, which I invite you to continue to hold as the cosmocentric self. I did research on folks who actually rest in this state that you're having right now most of the time <coughs> and make decisions from this place. Big self in action around sustainability. So let me share with you 
some of the stuff that we can <coughs> Sorry about the PowerPoint slides. Embrace uncertainty with deep trust. I sent you a paper with all this stuff. Like I sent it to Cam a couple days ago. You can write it down if you want, but it's all in there. Plus the side. Like Embrace uncertainty with deep trust. This is a key principle that I encountered these folks from doing, and that they had profound trust in themselves and the people that they were working with and the process that they were going through to navigate through the complexity that they were facing. So these were folks that were doing large-scale design of sustainability initiatives. Then it's a, <coughs> okay, fine. I, I, I recognize uncertainty is here and it's part of the game and I can just rest in it to a, wow, there's uncertainty and I can actually generate more of it as part of the co-creative process of creating a future that is an unprecedented flourishing of humanity and nature. And embracing it, stepping into it, stepping over that cliff. As Chongyang Chumpa says, the bad news is that you're falling out of control without a net. And the good news is that there's no ground. <laughs> Second thing that they did, they used a blend of their intuition and the rational mind powered by advanced frameworks. So these were leaders and change agents who were deeply grounded in some significant conceptual analytical capacity and they were using sophisticated frameworks, but they drew upon their intuition in spades. And that's simply because these systems that they were engaging in were too complex for the rational mind to get its head around, right? One of you was speaking into the dynamics of what's actually happening in here, how, how things are always changing. And if any of you study complexity theory, right? So there's this concept in complexity theory called complex adaptive systems, which is basically everything that we're trying to engage with here is a complex adaptive system because all of the different elements, all the different people, all the different organizations, all the different stakeholders are constantly learning and influencing each other. And so it's constantly adapting. There's no way we can have control over it. You can't make, I worked in market transformation, you can't make the cocoa sector go from unsustainable to, un, to sustainable in, in a linear way. All you can do is set up the conditions that support the emergence of sustainability in that sector, right? And do lots of experimentation for a time. So the intuitive mind then becomes this powerful way of tuning into insight to support responses, effective responses, when we just don't have a friggin' clue because we can't get our mind around it. No matter how much system dynamics modeling we do, no matter how good our GPS or our, 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 our geographical um, imaging work is, layers upon layers upon layers, right? It just becomes ad infinitum complexity at a certain point. And so the intuition supports that process. So here's an example of a, one of the people that I studied that went to a sustainability seminar and was so blown away in the process of that week of the community that was there and the, the, the thoughts that were there and, and the ideas and, and the embodiment work that at the end of it, he came out of it and he literally sat down at his desk in the hotel room and started writing for the next 12 hours. He just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. And it's like he couldn't stop writing. He had this huge download. And that download, this intuitive download that he was having, was ended up being the foundation of his, what is now his life's work. And he spent the last six years unpacking that with his conceptual mind, the intuitive download that came. Now, intuition doesn't always come like a lightning bolt like that. Sometimes it arises like a sun, sunrise, right? Just a little bit of illuminated an idea, and, and all of a sudden, we have a new recognition. And that's why the practice of being still in our mind and doing attention management, contemplation, meditation that allows the pond to still so we can actually hear 
the whispers of intuition, is absolutely critical for you as a change agent. Absolutely critical to be able to hear these whispers of, of intuition and, and act upon them and learn. They also used three different theories to navigate the complexity. So this is the advanced frameworks that they powered their rational minds with. Systems theory, complexity theory, and integral theory. And if you're not getting yourselves up to speed with these three theories over the course of your education, you, you should, because they have powerful um, insights for us in trying to understand what's happening around and how, to, and how to respond effectively to these complex challenges. All of them are very powerful, and they're all just constructs. Right? Learn, learn the tool, have a backpack full of frameworks, and then learn how to drop them all. And just be present to the raw, arising moment of this person right here, right now. And what can I actually learn from them? What do I, what's my response? See your work as a spiritual practice. So these practitioners, there was no difference between their spiritual practice and the sustainability work that they were doing in Nigeria or that they were doing at, to help make the Olympic screen. There was just no difference. It was their work. Their work in the world, it was their spiritual practice. There was, there was fundamentally no difference at all. So here's, here's an example of, of a, one of the people that I studied and she basically compared her work to karma yoga where the three moves of karma yoga are surrendering to the divine, releasing attachment to the fruits of her labor, and then working as hard as you can. So go out there, do the work that needs to be done while letting go of any belief in what the, the outcome should be. Just let arise what arises. As she, as she would say, allow the integrative nature of consciousness to do its thing. So she was completely grounded in uh, unity consciousness, and that's just the way that she did her sustainability work. What she do is she she tune into what she calls the evolutionary arc. And the evolutionary arc says, what's the next micro-developmental move in this moment for this individual, this system, this organization that I'm working with? Tunes into that, and then works to create the conditions for that to arise, and inquires into what what is it? How, how, how can I support that emergence? Adaptively manage with dynamic steering is this next one. <coughs> these change agents recognize that because all of these initiatives that they're working on, whether it's, it's at a, a local community level or at an urban level, some of them were helping entire populations uh, uh, in in the city to craft a new vision for who they wanted to become, right? Some of them were working with the Olympics, some of them were working with the UN system at a large scale. They, they adaptively managed. How they engaged is they actually did dynamic steering. That means that they did an awful lot of prototyping and testing, just seeing what would work. Because they knew they couldn't control the system, but let's be in dialogue with the system. So let me try this. And then they'd see how it would respond. Didn't work that well, so they'd experiment again, and experiment again, experiment again, experiment again. I was speaking with an executive the other day, and sort of the, the leading edge of innovation these days is fail fast and fail cheap, right? So prototype fast, 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 just get it out there, and, and just see the iterations that you can pull off, right? They had three particular roles that they took on, and the first role that they would adopt so these are real leadership roles at these later stages of consciousness these folks would, would engage in. And one is trying to be a catalyst. These were folks that would work on the system. They'd like try and get together all the people that had authority, power, and influence in that community or in that market or, or in that organization. And they'd push and prod and try and get them to see things in a new way. They, and they'd really try and essentially assertively get the system moving. Sometimes you gotta bring on that agentic, assertive approach to driving things. Yet there are other roles that they also managed to flow into. They weren't just stuck on this sort of pushing space, this, this masculine space. They also were cultivators. 
And, and by cultivator, and I described this more in the paper that, that I've sent to you guys already, they essentially were planting the seeds and setting up the conditions for development of these organizations and these systems. Meaning that they would, yes, bring together the people that had authority, power, and influence in the system, but then they would trust that that process itself and facilitating that dialogue in itself was a developmental move. It wasn't an, an intervention that was helping the system move forward on its own. So this was more of a stepping back away and, and really honoring the complexity of these systems and going, okay, what are the initial conditions that I can put in place? Where can I plant the seeds where novelty will emerge, where new ideas will come forth, where a new way of addressing this will actually show up? And so they were also cultivators. The final role that they held was this one of potential holder. And this was the one that was held by those that had the latest state of consciousness that science is able to measure. So these folks who were truly grounded in unity consciousness. They tended to shift toward this. And their approach was essentially one of grounding in cosmocentric awareness, which all of you have access to at any time. It's just a matter of dropping into it. You all did it. Grounding in that and then literally sensing into what's the next developmental move, what's the potential for this individual or this organization or this system to make a shift. What would that actually look like? And feeling into it and visualizing it. And then holding the energetic space for that emergence to happen. It's kind of like when you're in dialogue or two of your friends are arguing and you're holding the space for it to be a healthy argument by saying, oh, you know, well, you know, what he just said is actually valid and oh, but what she's saying is, is true as well. And you're kind of holding a larger container for them to have a good interaction, right? Or if you're facilitating, you're holding that space. These folks were holding the, the energetic potential for the individual or the system or the organization to transform. And then they were also constantly wondering into the system. I wonder what it would be like if we could come up with a low cost solution for hydroelectric power that was scalable, right? Wondering, wondering with this sort of inquiry, putting questions into cosmocentric awareness, basically planting these seeds. There's something about doing that that, that gets things moving. It's like putting intentions out there, right? Where stuff starts to shift and move just by the very practice of putting an intention out there. This may sound airy fairy, new agey to, to you. I'm reporting what these folks essentially are doing on a regular basis as part of their practice and feel like this is their secret weapon. One of them said, This is the real work of a change agent for this group to develop. And then allowing the integrative nature of consciousness to do its thing. That's, that's the real work. So let me wrap up here. So there are 15 big self competencies for consciously, consciously leading complex change that I identified. And those are in, in the document that you sent. I'm not going to go through those as well, but they touch on a lot of the things that we, we've engaged in today. And for those of you that, the, the, the beauty is that all of you are at a stage where your development of your consciousness is at a faster rate than it's probably ever been. At, because you've, you've kind of gotten into these later stages of development and you're, you still have mental plasticity and neurological firing and, 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 and synaptic connections that are very plastic, meaning that they're very malleable, which means that it's very easy for you to shift through some of these stages of development pretty quickly over the next few years. The folks that I assessed, there were change agents, they were assessed at these latest stages of consciousness, they were 33 and 35 um, years old, right? So you don't need to be 60 to kind of drop into these unitive consciousness spaces on a regular basis. And some of the competencies that I've laid out are actually, will, will help you to get there. So I just want to close by this recognition that the world needs our big self. It's time to step off the platform 
and step more fully into the deep potential that we have here arising out of our very being as we engage and go out into the communities that we work with, as we step into the organizations, bring the big self in the back pocket and make decisions from that space. Because it is the source and the seed of the creativity that we need to respond to our wicked problems.